Okay, so thank you again, everybody, for, for coming on this cold day, for sticking it out. Um, uh, we're really, really excited to see everybody here. I'm Jacob Moore. I'm the Associate Director of the Buell Center. Um, we ran out of programs, so that's exciting. We had no idea how many people to expect. Um, uh, and it's great that not only everybody came, but everybody uh, has stuck around. So just so you know, by the way, we're going to have this last panel, a concluding discussion, um, and then there's a reception that's going to happen right on the other side of the t-shirts that's open to everybody. So in case that's motivating to, to stick around, uh, there will be drinks. Um, okay, so as they're coming up, uh, this last panel, we're really excited to have everybody here. Um, uh, we have uh, CJ Bastida is a leader of the Fridays for Future Youth Climate Strike, an organizer of the Global Climate Strike, a member of the Administration Committee of the People's Climate, climate Movement, and is part of Sunrise Movement and Extinction Rebellion as well. Uh, Tecumseh Caesar, uh, who we heard from earlier, is a Native American artist and cultural consultant of uh, Matincock Turkey Clan, Wampanoag, uh, Montauket, and Blackfoot descent. Ama Francis is a uh, 2018 to 2020 Climate Law Fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. Diana Hernandez is an Assistant Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. She's also Director of the Community Engagement Corps of the NIEHS funded uh, Center for Environmental Health in Northern Manhattan. Um, Arash Kawazad is an artist, educator, and urban planner. Uh, and Moncho Lopez is a political scientist, cartographer, musician, composer, and South Bronx-based environmental activist who teaches uh, Latino and ethnic politics at Hunter College. He's also a founding member of South Bronx, South Bronx Unite and a board member of the Mott Haven Port Morris Community Land Stewards, the local community land trust. So um, uh, give it away to them for 20 minutes and then we'll hear from Jessica Ramos uh, after that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for your attention and your engagement and your presence around climate change, which I think we all know is a really important and pressing issue. My group, our group, was tasked with looking at the relationship with government, between government and power around three questions. Uh, how can the Green New Deal justly eliminate the use of fossil fuels? How can the Green New Deal meaningfully avoid green gentrification? And how can the Green New Deal equitably include frontline communities, workers, and non-US citizens? And as a starting point, our group acknowledged that climate change is not just an environmental issue, it's also an issue of racial, economic inequality, um, inequality between able-bodied people and people with disabilities, um, also an issue that deeply connects to indigenous communities who are on the front lines of these issues. And so climate, when we talk about climate solutions, we're not just talking about environmental solutions, but we're talking about in ways and opportunity to really transform our society across class, race, economic, um, and other lines of inequality. Uh, so to start us off, just in response to the question, how can the Green New Deal justly eliminate the use of fossil fuels? I think the key point here, um, and AOC mentioned this in the video, is the idea of a just transition. So when we're moving from reliance on fossil fuels to looking at um, sources of energy that are cleaner, and by cleaner we mean have lesser impact on the environment, but also cleaner in terms of how it affects the communities that are surrounding these sources of energy. It's important that the people who are most impacted by this transition are also part of the solution. Um, workers at coal mines, communities that are placed next to fossil fuel plants, these communities and people need to be at the front and center of the solution and benefiting from this transition to clean energy. So that just that idea of a just transition was the first um, thing that we really emphasized in relation to th this question. And I'll just keep it quick because this is a summary. Um, we also talked about green gentrification. So one thing that came out in our discussion is that when we promote sustainability measures, renters or people in um, low-income housing or people who are dependent on, um, who are 
I think struggling to meet costs of housing are often priced out of these buildings that are receiving this sustainability upgrade. And so we find that our climate measures are actually pushing people out of their homes, out of their communities. And so we talked about how to stop this and, and highlighted some good practices. And also important just to mention here that this is not just about displacement of people in the US, but as we've heard from other panels, climate is really a global issue. So our climate effects are not just displacing people in the Bronx um, or in Queens, but also across the global south, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific. And it's important to include these people also in an effort to be people of solidarity with black and brown communities around the world. It's important also to bring in these perspectives. Finally, yeah, good transition. We talked about how the Green New Deal can equitably include frontline communities, workers and non-US citizens. And for us here, the idea really was that everyone needs to be included. Um, everyone needs to be at the table. And again, this, this idea of, of climate not just being, I think the Green New Deal actually says this, that we're, the US is actually exporting the effects of pollution to other people, where other people are bearing the cost um, of, of our energy use here. And it's important when we're thinking about climate solutions to make sure that we're making space for people who are displaced by these issues. So how can we create more visa categories for climate migrants, for example? Um, how can we include non-US citizens in the job opportunities that are going to be coming from the Green New Deal? Uh, so just to wrap up, um, I think one of the key ideas from our panel was that we are sharing resources as a global community across race, class, ability lines, um, across national lines, and it's important to think about our responsibility to each other and sharing those resources. Um, and it's really critical that we organize because none of these changes will happen if we are not building collective power. Um, does anyone want to add? Yeah, shall we just go? Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for being here and for contributing to this discussion. I'll start um, by framing this the, the way that we began our panel in the morning. Um, and again, my background is as an artist and an urban planner, and I'm going to be speaking more from the perspective of an urban planner. But what we talked about in the morning is that, you know, I think we're faced with a very big decision. And the, the decision is, are we going to mandate that the Green New Deal more for, move forward through a process of community-based planning or a process of top-down planning. And what we have now in the city um, and the standard operating procedure is top-down planning. And with top-down planning, we, what we end up with are places like Willits Point, you know, the redevelopment. We end up with uh, Hudson Yards. You know, we end up with a lot of the big signature projects um, that you see being, happening in the city, you know, downtown Brooklyn, et cetera, Billionaire's Row, right? These are things that aren't done with, uh, you know, accountability at the community level, right? They're done with the interests of developers and, uh, you know, large corporations and, and power brokers in mind. And if we move forward with this process of whitewashing, which we have in the city now, then what will happen as a result of the Green New Deal is green gentrification, right? So I think that's one thing, is how are we as a community and how are we as New Yorkers standing up and saying with a unified voice that we're going to dictate what the plans are that are implemented at the local level and we're going to make sure that there's accountability in this process so the community isn't used to, you know, the community isn't co-opted, right? So their voices aren't co-opted and they're kind of put forward to say, look, we're doing democracy, but at the end of the day, what they want is in what's reflected in the plan, right? So I think that's a big choice that, that we have to move forward with. And a way that you would think about community-based planning is, is reflected in what you see on the panel here, right? We have indigenous voices that are, that are being centered. Uh, we're talking about, you know, gender nonconformity. We're talking about race. We're talking about class. And, and the, the, this is a makeup of what you would imagine a leadership group that's determining what's going to happen in the New Deal, right? And, and, but that's not what we have. We have AOC, but if I were to peel back the bigger curtain and see who's really making the decisions, I don't think that it, it, it looks like what we have here sitting on this panel, right? Um, so I think that's a big issue. Uh, are, do, should we go down and come back, or 
how, should I just get everything off my chest now? Are you, <laughs> like, like, okay, go for it. I have my notes here, so I'll be very brief. Um, so we, we talked about the, the community-based planning versus top-down planning. If you recall, the, the, the original New Deal was um, done with a lot of good intentions in mind, right? And there's a lot of infrastructure that we depend on today that came out of that. But every planning decision, or many, many planning decisions that ended up horribly for the community were done with good intentions, right? And, and, and they were done using the justification of technological progress, right? This is the newest thing. It's going to improve our efficiency. It's going to make society better and cleaner. Cars were thought of as being cleaner than horses at the time, right? And, and we turned out to the ho horses, on the other hand, weren't destroying the planet with climate change, right, to my knowledge. So we, we, you know, we can't jump into um, you know, this kind of hubristic mentality and just assume that because we're using the latest technology and it's different from what we had in the past, that it's going to be an improvement, right? So we, and and that's, that's how community-based planning can kind of reinforce this notion. But at the same time, with respect to uh, the speakers earlier, we understand that Con Edison and National Grid are creating issues but they're not the ones that are leading the gentrification of New York City, right? Our own institutions, our own city agencies, our own legislative bodies are the ones who are, who are gentrifying the city. They're the ones who are leading the rezoning processes. They're the ones who you know, are part of this process of endless and endless skyscraper development while many other people are, are living in substandard housing, right? Not to say that they're the only ones driving it because there's a whole system that they're a part of, but I think we have to reflect on ourselves and, and say, what are we doing to prevent gentrification as a city? You know, what are our institutions doing? And if they're not equipped to prevent gentrification now, then what measures are we putting in place to make sure that when we get all of this new development, it's not just going to follow the same pattern, right? So, so, so there's something there. And, and at the same time that we have a city that's, that's gentrifying ourselves, right, through luxury development, we have other expenditures that are occurring that are criminalizing young people, right? Young people of color in this city and disincentivizing the kind of behavior that we need to decarbonize our society. And I'm thinking specifically about transit enforcement, right? So one thing, I think it's a, it's a myth to say that broken windows is a thing of the past, right? That, you know, maybe, maybe in recent times that might have been something that people entertain, but we see now with the increased police presence in the subways, uh, we see now with the, the war on the homeless or houseless and, and, you know, many other things that are happening in the city uh, with surveillance culture, that broken windows isn't a thing of the past, right? And you have a situation in the subway where the MTA is spending $200 million, $250 million to fight against fare evasion in order to save $200 million, right? $200 million in fare evasion. So the, the issue there is you are criminalizing young people of color for using mass transit when the reality should be the opposite, right? We have free transit for everyone. So how is the Green New Deal addressing this kind of over-policing, you know, uh, the, the, the policies of over-policing uh, that, that, would, that, that would not only prevent gentrification from happening if they reversed it, but it would also incentivize people to take mass transit, right? So these are kinds of the things when you, when you think about how people are treated in our communities. They're not traditional development concepts. Not, they don't come up in a, in, a, in a normal discussion about sustainability. But that's what we need to take into account if we want our communities to stay intact as we move forward in, into this, this era of green development. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass there. Um, but those are just some, some top things that, that came to mind. Uh, all right, so um, Diana Hernandez, I am just going to put my researcher hat on and say that there are really amazing policies uh, that actually have, um, are on some measure successful, and we talked about the clean heat uh, policies here in New York City that phased out the use of residual oil, number six. Uh, but when my team and I actually looked at who really benefited from transitions to clean energy, uh, it happened not to be uh, the buildings that were uh, in northern Manhattan and the Bronx. Uh, so uh, while uh, the, the city can really tout a big success in saying that um, they successfully phased out the use of number six oil, for number four, that actually hasn't been the case. And what it means is that uh, those buildings uh, in northern Manhattan and the Bronx are likely not to transition to clean fuels until 2030 when it completely phases out. And that's really unacceptable. Uh, and the assemblywoman on the last panel 
basically talked about the need for evaluation, uh, and that's absolutely true. It's also really true in public housing. Uh, so public housing has a lot of different issues going on, but one of the kind of um, more promising potentially uh, things that, that, that are actively happening uh, here in New York City and across uh, the U.S. Uh, is the Rental Assistance Demonstration Project. Uh, the first one was in a Sandy-affected complex uh, in the Rockaways, uh, and the second one is in Batanzas in Mott Haven, where I live. Uh, and ultimately, uh, these projects have gone on without evaluation. They, we don't really know what the impact is. We know that the policy promises to keep people in place, uh, even as their uh, units are improved. Uh, but ultim ultimately, there needs to be uh, you know, investment on the part of uh, policymakers to also embed uh, evaluation and research into uh, the policies that are uh, put forth. Otherwise, we really don't understand the impact, and it happens to be that researchers like me that are hustling for outside dollars uh, come in uh, and uh, are assisting with that evaluation, but it should really be kind of integrated. There was another piece that I think this is outside of the, the research realm that I think is really important, and that's the question of listening. So first of all, let me acknowledge that it's late in the day. This has been a long uh, you know, session, and that all of you have been so wonderfully patient and participatory, uh, so thank you. Um, but the truth of the matter is that we have a lot to say. Many of us actually wear dual hats. Uh, you know, we, we are layered human beings. While we might have some kind of technical expertise, some of us are also coming from communities of need, and I definitely sit, uh, I straddle worlds of uh, expertise and a lot of privilege on, on my institutional affiliation, and at the same time, I feel like at my core, I'm representing the South Bronx where I grew up and where I have chosen to live. And ultimately, um, when we think about politicians and what they uh, are in position to do and other policymakers, is actually to listen, that like we actually have a lot to say and that it's not just their job to come in uh, and give us their little five minute stump speech, but that participating in something like this uh, all day is actually a demonstration of a willingness to, uh, to listen uh, and to reimagine governance. And that was one of the things that came up uh, in our session today is that we're really at a time where we have to kind of think about decentralizing government and at the same time uh, reimagining and reconstituting uh, what, what it means to represent. That it's not necessarily about your own ideas, but that those ideas are truly inspired by the people that, that the constituencies uh, that you're representing. Uh, that your duty is not necessarily to just share, but it's also to listen. Hi, my name is Tecumseh, um, representing uh, my tribe, the Matinecock, but also our sister tribes of Siwanahaki, Long Island. Um, and for the first question, as for uh, justifying the um, eliminating the fossil fuels, I gave an example of the Shinnecock Reservation, which is our sister uh, community in Southampton. And uh, because of rising sea levels and beach erosion, we actually found uh, their cemeteries being flooded. And we also found that uh, they had to have a major, um, basically like progressive plan to stop beach erosion because their beach was actually eroding up to like 20, 30 feet. And this is a tribe, our tribes have been here for thousands of years. so. This is a, they have about 800 acres of land that they have been pushed onto. Only their summer, uh, would be traditionally their summer villages. And um, now there's a very big uh, threat that their environmental, say, environmental department is saying uh, it's quite possible that they're going to have to relocate. And one of the things that we talked about is um, making sure that we're not just relocating people, but figuring out how can we help them stay in their communities where they have connections to, um, whether it's like uh, our indigenous brothers and sisters who literally our ancestors are buried here and we want to take care of them, or it's um, people who have roots to those communities and the moving might cause separation uh, between families and um, different things that tie them down. And then uh, for the second question, talking about uh, 
avoiding gentrification, green gentrification. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, animals because often that's something that is totally overlooked and uh, we're taught that each animal has a specific responsibility and with things like the mosquito population where we're spraying for mosquitoes, I always ask myself, well, where did the bats go? And uh, why is that population not being looked at? And why are we putting forth efforts towards spraying for mosquitoes but not figuring out who the original eaters of those mosquitoes are and why they've disappeared? Uh, things like glass houses where we know in traditional ways that New York is actually a migration area for birds and uh, many of my indigenous brothers and sisters in Manhattan have actually found birds with broken beaks in front of glass buildings. And why is that not being addressed? And uh, the importance of pre prime informed consent. So talking to communities and understanding that they can actually pull back their consent um, for what's been given and that that should be applied. It shouldn't be just me here today, but it should be representatives from all the um, governments that are, that are still on Siwa Anahaki, uh, Shinnecock, Uncachug, Setauket, uh, Lenape, all these representatives could be here today, but they, you, you know, they weren't brought to the table. And um, talking about the housing a little bit, uh, we were talking about the, when you have, for instance, I live in subsidized housing, and uh, when they did the capital improvement, that cost came to me. But I felt that it should have came in a tax break to the, uh, to the owner of the building, so that way it's not being put on towards the, uh, the consumers who, once we move out, we don't have any equity in, in that space. Um, so those are just quickly uh, things that I felt were really important. And as for the last part uh, for non-citizens, um, a point that I brought up is that we call this area Turtle Island, and as far as we're concerned, uh, U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and the Caribbean, uh, those are not immigrants. The immigrants are basically anybody who came from Europe. And uh, a lot of times we disconnect ourselves with the fact that people whose grandparents or great-grandparents came here, they have the privilege of not knowing what it is to be an immigrant. And we need to have more empathy and more understanding of who's an immigrant and who's not an immigrant, but really who is a human being um, and also, you know, another living being. So this Green Deal needs to encompass humans, um, but also animals and those other beings that actually came la uh, before us. Because in my teachings, we're taught that humans are actually the last, peop the last thing put on the earth. Um, I already spoke, so I'll, I'll just keep this brief, but I did want to just share um, that I am deeply saddened about the climate crisis that we're going through, and at the same time being a descendant of people who were enslaved. Um, the fact that I'm sitting here today gives me hope. I know that we have the collective power to make transformative change, and I specifically want to talk about the change that needs to happen in terms of immigration. The climate crisis is creating millions of displaced people around the world. It's forcing people out of their homes, out of their homelands. Just in 2018, last year, we had nearly 18 million people displaced by climate-related disasters. 18 million people of no fault of their own being forced out of their homes. And so on the US side, we also need to be thinking about decriminalizing immigration and also making it easier for people to migrate. And that can look like a number of things. Bernie Sanders has just put forth this proposal to increase family reunification, so making it easier for people to connect with their families. There are other ways that we can also increase visa categories, and this is something that the federal government alone is in power to do. The federal government controls immigration, and so this, if we're talking about federal reform, immigration definitely needs to be on the table, especially when we take into consideration the justice issues associated with climate. My name is, my name is Moncho Lopez. Uh, I was born in Puerto Rico. I'm a, a South Bronx uh, activist. Um, we, in, in the South Bronx, we have a group, uh, I'm a co-founder, 
uh, called South Bronx Unite. South Bronx Unite it's, um, began many years ago as an environmental justice organization. Now we are sponsoring, meaning South Bronx Unite, uh, the South Bronx Community Land Trust. So I think that that's um, an important sequence to understand because we began and we remain an environmental justice organization that came to realize that control over land was extremely important uh, to address the environmental justice issues uh, that, that we were facing. So, so I, I think that um, the, the, the idea of community land trust is one of the most important uh, and central ideas that we in the South Bronx uh, stumbled upon or have rallied around to address uh, the environmental justice issues. Um, I, I have, uh, as you know, as uh, strange as it might seem, uh, I, I need to put like a really critical eyeglasses on. In the South Bronx today, one of the most important perceived threats to us is private development. Okay, and, and so that's common for all over the city. But the fact is that historically, the entity that has abused the most our people is the government. Now we have a problem with private developers. It was the government that allowed the South Bronx to burn down. And so here we have government and power I think that we need to be careful of not placing too much faith in these types of legislation because if you look at it, I'm, I mean, it's like, you know, the, the X-Files, the truth is out there. If you look, look at it here, you see that this uh, alternative, uh, the Champlain Hudson Power Express system, it's uh, symbolized in the map as a red line. It's a red line that loops around the South Bronx. For me, that triggers me immediately because we have a history like these, uh, you know, I'm in total support of, uh, of the Green New Deal. I, I'm not a, a Republican. It's like, um, I, I support it. That being said, this has the, all the necessary ingredients, the good intentions, the urgency, the scale, the complexity for experts to take over. And if they can take over, and we're not paying attention, they will. Everything that can go wrong with this will go wrong if we're not paying attention. And, and, and so what we in, in, in South Bronx Unite and our CLT is designed to defend ourselves against development, private people, but also against the government because we need to, to be prepared that very easily they can try to sacrifice once again our community for the supposed greater good. And that's something that we are not going to allow uh, to happen. This is a, a community that has been brutalized, uh, traumatized. I think that we should all get very, very well educated about the technicalities of all of this. They were talking about gigawatts before. Uh, I educated myself when Hurricane Maria happened and destroyed Puerto Rico. I, in, uh, I became an expert in, in watts, in, in volts, in, in amp hours. Uh, Francisco Casablanca and Libertad, they, 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 they were supportive of all the research that I did on solar power, on, on wind power. Educate yourselves because that's the only way that you're not going to be fooled. That's the only way that we are not going to get fooled. We need to educate ourselves as to the very technical aspects of this. It's technical, but it's not rocket science. So if I figure it out, I think that we all can, can figure it out. We have to spread that uh, education uh, out there. The, the last thing that I'm going to mention, uh, two more things. Uh, what, what we don't need eventually, obviously, is that uh, we don't want the Green New Deal and the, the pipes and whatever to be part of what I, I've been calling the infrastructure of trauma. Uh, infrastructure that, that traumatizes people. 
uh, infrastructure that is part of this uh, non-spoken uh, neo-colonial social contract, that I'm going to give you this in exchange of that. You know, you need jobs, you need clean air, you need good housing, so let's, you know, and this, this can easily go uh, the Robert Moses way, and even larger. So, so we have to, to, to be very attentive. The, the last thing I'm, I'm going to say is that governments lie. Government lies all the time, for obvious reasons, okay? And so my stomach turns when suddenly I heard here today, not because I'm opposed to it, the mention of Rikers Island as the new solution for the green thing here in the city. That's a place of torture, of kidnapping, and suddenly we're talking, we're greenwashing the story of that place. Where are the bodies of the people that, that have been kidnapped? We're talking about closing Rikers. I don't believe it. I don't think it's going to happen. But we're building these uh, mixes of, of uh, jails uh, that are supposedly to be humane and community jails with, with shopping malls in, in, uh, in our neighborhoods. And so we haven't dealt with the problem of kidnapping and incarceration, and we are already talking about Rikers Island being the green thing and the, you know, the sewage treatment plan or whatever, 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 solar farms and whatnot. Uh, I, I use that as an example of how governments lie and that we need to, we need to be critical we, we need to make alliances with people in government and whatnot, but we need to pay attention because if not, they're going to do a roar Moses on us over and over and over again. Okay? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shia Bastida. I am a 17-year-old climate justice activist. I was... Born and raised in Mexico, moved here when I was 13. Uh, now I'm part of People's Climate Movement, Fridays for Future, Sunrise Movement, and I done job with the CLCPA, the Dirty Buildings Bill, and other legislation here in the city. So I want to talk about a few things. Um, the first thing is definitely climate education. This coming from a student who skips school every Friday uh, to strike for a future. Um, <laughs> Education is probably one of the most important things, and that is because our biggest problem is not denialism, but apathy. People know what is wrong, but they don't want to do anything about it. It might be too big, they might not know what angle to look at it, and that is why we need education through all sectors. You are all here because you care about this issue, but you need to, we all need to understand that we need to increase our deepening of understanding of the situation. Because our goal here should not be to convince everybody about the climate crisis. Our goal should be to deepen our own understanding to be able to tackle this mo the most, in the most efficient way. Um, so I have friends who are in the policy sector, education sector, transportation sector, energy sector. And that means suing the government, writing yeah, suing the government, <laughs> um, writing climate curriculum into schools and doing so many things that are essential for us. Um, and just as students, I think that because I think I am one of the only under 20 here, how many people are here under 20? Okay, youth are 20, yes, youth are 20% of the present, but we are 100% of the future. I want to let you know that if this is going to exceed these talks, which are amazing, we need to educate youth. And that sounds so obvious, but that means that we need to go into schools, we need to go into engagement. I, in, as part of my environmental club, uh, we go up to Albany to speak to our representatives, and one time I tell them, okay, everybody email your 
uh, representative scheduler and set up a meeting. And everybody said, what? That's a thing? We can talk to representatives? Yes. Uh, so those things that we don't know as young people who care are things that we must be taught and we are not getting that kind of training. Um, and I also wanted to touch upon immediate needs. Uh, we heard about immediate needs in presentations previous to ours and my immediate need right now is to pass my AP Physics test. <laughs> but I also want to let you know that as youth our immediate need is to be secured of a livable future. And that is when I think a lot of the world is not understanding where our care comes from. We are scared of what is coming and we are mad that nothing is being done because we have the solutions. Where is that going towards? And so that's why I'm very happy that, you know, youth all of, over the world are standing up and saying, yes, we need um, global momentum, and the youth are bringing that. We need or to organize, we need to come together. And a big part of that is going to come from youth who are organizing seven million people strikes, right? Um, and that is when intergenerational conversation has to come into, because there's this whole thing, I don't know if you heard the OK Boomer thing. I don't, yes, I don't like that. And that is because, yes, we didn't create this mess, you did, but that doesn't mean that we don't need everybody, everybody in every sector to work towards it and to fix this and to get it over with. Because I wanted to be a veterinarian, now I'm gonna study environmental studies and international relations because <laughs> there is no other way for me to feel like I can help if it's not through an environmental lens. Um, so, we, yeah, we just need more mindful solutions, more mindful approaches to things. And if, I, if you wanna take one thing away from today, it's everything. I don't think we can pick what to take away because everything that was said today is important. And everything that was said today, you need to implement in your work, your thinking, your conversations, your daily lives and the way you vote, not only in elections, but with your money in businesses. So thank you so much. Okay. I think that, that's the, for now, but then we'll have the Q&A in a second. Um, I'm really happy to introduce uh, Jessica Ramos, who's here um, joining us. Jessica Ramos has spent her life uh, fighting for working families, advocating for labor, and organizing her local community. Born in Elmhurst to an undocumented seamstress and a printing pressman, Jessica was raised in Astoria, attended Queens Public Schools, and now lives in Jackson Heights with her two sons, where, where she represents the 13th district uh, in the New York State Senate. So, Jessica. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very proud to represent, actually, the Queens Museum. We're in the district right now. Um, and find it very appropriate that this conversation is actually being held in this room, surrounded by this exhibit. One of the perks of being the state senator for the Queens Museum is that I get to come to the previews and meet the artists. Um, but what the exhibit is actually about is a statement on consumerism. All of these t-shirts um, were picked up at thrift shops in the artist's travels. Um, and really does, at least to me, stand as a powerful statement about how much waste it is that we actually create unnecessarily. Um, and to really think about what consumer behaviors we, we must change. And that, I think, is the hardest part of it all, is that some folks do know where the solutions are, do understand uh, where it is that we need to change how we live our lives, but are not willing to, or the government has not facilitated uh, the way for us to do that. Um, even though a couple of things happened in the past session. So folks know we had a historic session in the state Senate. We have a democratic majority, finally, after decades of uh, suffering under the Republican helm. 
Thank you. A lot of you guys were very instrumental in that, largely because we wanted to pass a Climate and Community Protection Act that really worked. And while it was severely watered down by you know who, um, and now we call it the Climate Leadership and uh, Community Protection Act, it is still largely inspired by the Green New Deal and focused on bringing environmental justice to frontline communities like mine. I actually deal with some of the highest asthma rates in our city, um, particularly in Astoria, which has now been dubbed uh, Astor Astor um, uh, Asthma Alley, uh, which is really a, a, an eye-opener because we don't think of Astoria in that way necessarily, but because of the Con Edison plant that's there um, and because of everything that's been going on uh, it, environmentally, it's really been um, a game changer uh, for the conversation and why we fought so hard for the CCPA uh, to include funds that would be redirected towards these very same communities that have been hurting the most. Um, and, and really, it's about shifting the paradigm entirely and moving away from an economy that's based on exploitation and fossil fuels and moving towards one that really dignifies work and that makes sure that we're prioritizing clean energy. I don't know if folks have, have brought this up throughout the conversations today, but there's actually huge crisis with National Grid that we aren't really talking about as much, um, which is very convenient for many, but um, essentially all of the new buildings, uh, new restaurants, commerce, aren't able to open new gas accounts with National Grid because we're out of gas, quite literally. Um, and that's a problem because then the answer can't be fracking. The answer can't be figuring out, um, you know, how it is that we fulfill that, that capitalistic driven need, but rather how it is that we're saying uh, that we're providing viable alternatives for these businesses to be able to run in an equitable way, in a way that, that really is responsive to climate change. And, those are very hyper-local decisions um, that are going to perhaps take some time for us to figure out. But holistically, um, I think this conversation has finally been elevated to a place where real policy um, is, to, is being passed, real policy is being heard, real policy is being written, but it needs to be written much more by the people than rather than the contractors who would even benefit from a Green New Deal, to be quite honest, right? Everybody has a vested interest. You know, even any business tycoon knows exactly where, where, where all of this is headed. Um, and ultimately, you know, this is why we need to make sure even if we retrofit buildings, that these buildings remain affordable for tenants, right? I'm, I'm a preferential renter. This is part of the reason I ran for office. Um, and, and these are one of, or some of my biggest concerns when it comes to talking about a green issue. I used to complain that really, you know, this topic was a white people issue. For a long time, it felt that way. And, and really seeing how that conversation has shifted, particularly for a district like mine, where we speak 160 languages, where we have people from all walks of life, right? It is particularly important that we're, that we're doing this today, that we're putting our brains together, that we're trying to figure out, hopefully, um, what new legislation uh, can look can look like, how we're making sure that we're putting pressure on uh, government to release more funds for things like community, community land trusts, which I'm a big fan of as well, how we think of a people's banking system and how we actually utilize this moment to create actual wealth for our communities and, gener and, and generational wealth for our communities. So I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for, for really bringing this to the forefront today. Um, obviously, there's gonna be a ton more work to do to make sure that the Green New Deal is a reality. And I promise to stand as an ally and fight shoulder to shoulder with you. Thank you. Okay, so um, just a couple notes before we do the Q&A. So I think, uh, 
we're sort of off the program now. The idea is actually that we're going to do just 30 minutes of Q&A, again, probably two or three rounds of three questions, and everybody up here can answer. But it'll be, this is also the concluding conversation, so think about that. Um, if you have questions for the other panelists you've seen speak, or anyway, so, so cue those up. And then at 5.30, we have uh, 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 Paul Evans, the catering company, has graciously front-loaded a little bit our reception. So at 5.30, we'll go over there for drinks, and we can continue the conversation, obviously. So, uh, so just like before, um, we'll take questions three at a time. Please keep them brief, one question per person, and then um, do a round, and then we'll do it again. So I saw one back in the back and one here in the green, sh green jacket. Yes. We can start in the back. Hello. Um, I have a question for... Uh, Senator Ramos, I have an issue that's directly impacting my community. The building of the LaGuardia Air Train that's connecting LaGuardia to uh, Willis Point. It's creating a lot of air pollution and damaging homes. What is your position on the air train and what are steps are you taking if you are against it? Thank you for the question. Uh, the LaGuardia Airport air train is of grave concern to the larger district, but specifically to the East Elmhurst community um, that completely surrounds um, the LaGuardia Airport. And there has been a lot said about the trajectory of the air train. Um, and I think that unfortunately, the conversation has moved to a place where it seems like more constituents are actually okay with the idea of an air train being built, which is really concerning to me because, because largely we've been working a lot with Riverkeeper um, and a couple of the other organizations who have been advocating for the cleaning up of Flushing Bay, for making sure um, that there is a community process involved in the future steps of, La of the LaGuardia Air Train. But up until this moment, um, my stance has been to be against uh, the air train um, and make sure that we are really holding the Port Authority accountable for shoving a project down our throats without even including a conversation with us. I just have a quick follow-up. So on the EIS report, uh, most of the comments were about finding solu alternative solutions, like extending the N train. Yes. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. So extending the N and W train from th um, going north on 31st Street. I don't know if everybody's from Queens, but in Astoria, the idea is that the N and the W would head north and then kind of just go towards LaGuardia. That has actually been debated at Community Board 1 for decades. It has been a huge short source of contention, but one that I think is still worth pushing for. Um, I think that change can be very hard for many people, um, but that's not to say that we should give up on what the most viable option is. Okay, and just, so I'm gonna collect three questions, so just for the panelists, then we'll wait to answer those until they've all been collected, just to try and pack more in. So, here in the green. Hi. Um, so thank you for, for mentioning about, Oscar, about uh, the greenwashing also and about how we have to sort of stay vigilant in, in the, the government actions in our community. I was born and raised and now live in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and we're currently dealing with the, one of the East, Coast, East Side Coastal Resiliency Plans that is, since our neighborhood was heavily affected by Hurricane Sandy, how to prevent uh, future flooding from storm surges and also sea level rise. And what has just been sort of uh, troubling to me is how the narrative is evolving around what resiliency is in this sort of, uh, that we have to protect ourselves from nature rather than that resiliency should also be about healing some of the damage that has been done to nature and also to our communities. And I'm wondering some of, your, of the, the panel's thoughts more about how we can start to shift these kind of colonial narratives of even in uh, greenwashing and in the Green New Deal and in resiliency planning of seeing it more as this holistic way of a design process uh, that it's, that's not just about protection, but also about healing. Yes. Okay, another question. We have one over here, and then one in the back. 
was up. Could somebody bring him? Yeah, over here in the, okay. in the, exactly. And then after her, in the back there with her hand up, yeah. Thank you. So uh, Champlain Hudson Power Express. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that has to do with New York City's um, effort to get power from Hydro-Quebec, which is a horrible company that is, you know, harming indigenous folks in Canada. So talk about the need for transnational solidarity and relying on big dams, um, big hydro, which is completely environmentally incorrect and, and horribly damaging. So there is actually um, a big event about New York City's effort to bring, you know, power through Hydro-Quebec down, down here and as if that's a green way to get more power for the city. On Tuesday evening, if you, I guess, go to the website of Sierra Club New York City, they're the ones who are hosting it. Okay, and the question in the back, yep. Uh, thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, the participants, the panel members, the organizers, everybody. I found it really inspiring to hear from you all today. Um, and it seems that we're all on the same page here. We're all willing to move forward with something. And I'm wondering how you're capitalizing on our participation today and how we can um, more effectively be, what, be in those spaces to, to do something about it. And something that I find incredibly frustrating about this movement is that you know, we, have, we don't have the socioeconomic liberty, most of us, to take time away from what we're doing to contribute to, to something like this that we're all deeply passionate about, and it's something that I greatly envy of the youth movement. Um, so I'm wondering if you could please, in your uh, closing remarks, speak to that. Um, I'll, I, I wanted to just respond quickly to the first point and hopefully get to the other ones, but uh, in terms of changing the narrative and, and you know, moving away from the colonial narrative, my reflection on the Green New Deal is that I think we have the green part figured out, we have the new part figured out, but we don't have the deal part figured out. And the deal for the original New Deal, the way that I see it was to build American empire. That, that was the project, right? We're going to give you a job and in, in return you're going to make, you're going to grow this engine, right? And, you know, I don't know how many um, wars later we've realized that the engine was built to do something that's very bad for the planet, right? And, and the, the Green New Deal can't just be about further building the empire and growing the empire and growing our GDP, analyzing everything by economic growth, creating more jobs. It has to be about something different. And the different thing that I hear from the panel isn't, that, isn't just about give me a job, right? It's about justice. It's about dignity. It's about human rights. It's about restoration of nature. It's about mother nature, you know, uh, respecting the rights of, of mother nature and, and, and understanding what that means. And going back and looking at our history and dealing with some of the atrocities that our governments have committed. And that's very different from, from just getting a job. Something that that's reflected in is not the Green New Deal, but the Red New Deal. Um, and the Red New Deal is something that we have uh, an excerpt from in this pamphlet, which is a People's Climate Action Plan for New York City. And I've, I developed it with some people at the, the CUNY Graduate Center, and we have copies here. And in, in the Red New Deal, I'll just read really quickly, it says, um, it's not the Red New Deal because it's the same old deal. The fulfillment of treaty rights, land restoration, sovereignty, self-determination, decolonization, and liberation. Ours is the oldest class struggle in the Americas. Centuries-long resistance for a world in which many worlds fit. Indigenous peoples are best suited to lead this important movement, but it must come from the ground up. So th this, I think, is a, a, a contrast and something that can be injected into the discussion uh, to talk more about human rights and indigenous peoples' issues and, and things along those lines. And, and the way that I think we can build power around that is by connecting with other movements, right? We, uh, we know that there's, it's not up to us to stop gentrification. There are other movements in the city that we can partner with and work together with, right? I know about MCIs, which are major capital improvements, right? One of the ways that landlords can pass down rent increases to their tenants is through MCIs, even in rent-stabilized units. And, and if you think about all of the technological upgrades we're talking about as part of the Green New Deal, there's a big issue with is that cost gonna be passed down to tenants, right? And I know about that because of people I know in the housing movement, right? So we have to, we have to join forces and build power across these disciplines and, and we can start to address the fundamentals of what the deal is, right? It's not just a job and economic growth, but it's actually degrowth, right? It's actually about human rights. It's about 
values that, that aren't um, commodities, right? So um, I, I wanted to just address that point and some things I, I didn't get to mention earlier. Uh, and there's, there's more in this, in this pamphlet as well. I guess I'll add to that and say um, that in some ways the reframing of this has also, uh, I think, calls to question resilience in a different kind of way. Uh, so resilience is uh, kind of in, a more, in, in the most fundamental of ways, the idea that people rebound that there's some kind of a shock and then they rebound. But the truth of the matter is that in our most vulnerable populations, the rebound, if they're going to anything, isn't actually enough. And really what we need to be thinking about is security, right? We want people to live secure, dignified lives, period. And when there is some kind of a crisis, they actually have reserves built up that they can call on those resilience reserves and say, there's been a significant issue, I need to rebound, and what I'm rebounding to is dignified, and it's enough. And that is not, we don't have that at this point. We're calling upon uh, communities to be more resilient when they're resilient every day. When you can't pay for food, when you can't pay for housing, when your energy bill is so high, and you're not sure how you're making ends meet, that is a resilience, that is an everyday resilience for everyday hardships that we need to question uh, in the context of the Green New Deal and, and anything else. And I think we also need to make the connections between what we understand to be clean energy on which side of the equation. So if we're thinking about clean energy, again, on the demand side, we say, oh, well, we benefit from clean energy because we're completely electrified. But if we're not necessarily thinking about the source, we have to question that and then really consider whether or not it's clean. And we have to think about that source also being global. Uh, where are those resources stemming from to begin with that we consider to be uh, clean uh, you know, on the user side? So there's a lot to question. I think we really need to push back on these kind of notions of clean and green and resilient uh, because as terms, they are also loaded with assumptions about what's at the baseline, and that baseline for many communities isn't great. Uh, I, I, I wanted to mention the, the dynamic of cultural uh, organizing also, that um, when we speak about the, the Green New Deal, uh, and progressive uh, initiatives in general, uh, we have, as has been mentioned, the, the propensity to think uh, about, about progress and, and measuring progress in terms of uh, cash, finances, monies. Um, and, 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 and we, on, on, on the good side, in a way, are, are totally complicit uh, on that uh, when we talk about uh, anti-displacement strategies, for example, uh, and when we narrate the gentrification process, obviously uh, affordability, it's, it's uh, at the center of it. However, to reduce uh, people and the fears of, of families uh, of displacement uh, to, to just a cheap rent, uh, it's, it's disrespectful and, and political malpractice. People don't want to remain in, in the places there are just because there's a cheap rent. So I think that the issues of memory, culture, um, emotions are extremely important when we consider uh, our organizing. And, and the other thing that I, I wanted to mention to uh, address the question here is that, you know, I'm uh, in a way like a, like a piano with one, uh, you know, uh, Note, uh, for me, the solution for almost everything is, is to organize. Uh, organize, organize, organize. We are um, fortunate that, that we all are part uh, of different uh, communities. Uh, virtual communities and real communities, the places that we live, the places where we work, the places where we study, uh, study the places where we worship. And so I, I think that in any of those uh, spheres that you move, you can organize. When, when the Hurricane Maria uh, struck Puerto Rico, it was because we had networks uh, of, of organizing in the Lower East Side and in the South Bronx 
that we were able to make a small uh, difference and a small contribution because those networks, the, the CLT national network here in the United States, those people send people, they send uh, monies. Uh, it's, it's important to organize because you can always organize the local, you can always leverage the local organizing that you do uh, to help and support other uh, movements and other causes. So I think it's really important, don't ever discard any type of organizing because it's, you know, unsexy or too hyper-local, whatever. Two or three people united in common intention for something good, it's bound to, to make a, a difference and it's better to have you all, uh, you know, together than, than just uh, watching Netflix uh, mindlessly, okay? So, yeah. Although, that's cool as well, so. No okay, judgment. I think, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I think we have time for three more questions, so one more round. I wasn't looking over here before, so I didn't miss any, right? Okay, right there in the middle with yes, exactly, waving, and then right behind you, exactly. The two of you, and then I can take one more if somebody has anything queued up. I wanna thank everyone for the uh, amazing assembly, all of the panelists, Francisco Casa, over there. Um, and I think it's Gabriel Solano, right? wherever he is. Um, so I wanted to uh, just introduce myself. My name is Ingrid Gomez, and I am a community organizer and activist. And I've recently uh, participated in an assembly that DSA and New York, New York Communities for Change and Food and Water Action um, put together. And in that, we are organizing a movement for a Green New Deal. And what we're doing is we are reaching out to our state senators and our state assembly members um, regarding pushing the governor to sign a Green New Deal. What would that look like? It would be public utilities, right? Free public utilities. It would be taxing the rich to pay for a Green New Deal. Um, I think they're saying 5% should be higher. <laughs> And they also 100% um, renewable energy and a complete divestment in fossil fuels. So I, I wanted to address uh, Senator Ramos and ask you publicly, since you did say you're an ally, if you would sign on to this letter that we're going to present to the governor. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be contacting your office. Thank you. There's um, one right behind you, you go, okay, and then we'll come to you. Um, my name's Andrea, I'm from the Democratic Socialists of America, um, from our public power campaign, which we spoke about a little. Um, so we're trying to win, as other people have stated, a, a, a public takeover of our energy sector um, across the entire state, so not just Con Ed, but um, other investor-owned utilities, and also win public generation. Um, through legislation that we're going to be introducing as part of the coalition that Ingrid just mentioned. Um, and I really appreciate the conversation. I think one thing we're really cognizant of is that we have to frame public power and also through our legislation address um, tenants and workers and not just protect them, but actually reverse structural inequalities there. Um, so for instance, we're researching a bill to fund um, public housing in the New York um, in NYCHA through a public utility um, and also address things like MCIs and take back heat from the purview of landlords which they often use to effectively evict their tenants. Um, but I guess my question for you is how we sort of link up all these fights that are happening, um, like the fight for housing, the fight for transportation, um, even things like firing these MTA cops, um, really transitioning to a, a just and sustainable economy, um, aka a Green New Deal, before it, um, before it inevitably gets co-opted by um, special and capitalist interests. Okay. And we have one more, the last question right over here. I don't know if there's a mic that can, wait, I can just do this. I just want to say thank you so much. You have given so much knowledge and you've given your heart and your spirit and your organization and all that is contributing to hopefully a good green new deal. But as a person that was on a community board, as a person who's political science major and environmentalist, I would hope this conversation Years ago, there was a thing called block associations. And if you live in an apartment building, there may be a neighbor association where you get to know your neighbors, where you share this conversation, 
where you build upon each other, where maybe consumerism can be less because your neighbor has something they don't need or you have something they need and you help each other. Or you go to your community board meetings and you make this conversation known in the community board meetings. You go to your civic meetings because they're all in your communities. And you make your voices heard and you share the conversation. You go to wonderful people like this senator and, and just keep moving, as that gentleman said over there, organize, be present, and make connections, because we're all connected. And if we don't connect our dots, then this won't happen. Thank you. Uh, the uh, two points, or a couple points, there's, there's two things that everyone in this room has in common that I can tell. One is that we're all human beings, and two is that we all have lithium in our pockets, right? That, that's one, th those are two things we all have in common. I, I make that point uh, in reference to the comment about renewable energy, this, the first comment. You know, we, we set targets for renewable energy, and we, we go into them in a very committed manner. We don't ask a lot of questions, or in my opinion, I don't think we ask enough questions about what is renewable energy? Where is it coming from? Is it, is it ethical because it's renewable? Um, or are those two things not always the same thing, right? Uh, and I think it's important in this example to look to the development of the oil industry. Even though lithium is a different material than oil, the economy that they both operate within, that those industries operate within, isn't different, right? And in the oil industry, there wasn't a, there, there wasn't a place to sell oil until they actually created the industry around it, right? It was used li a little at first, but eventually there was a gigantic industry that was created that required the input of oil, and it, and it made the oil industry itself grow as a result. And that's the exact same thing that we're doing with lithium now, right? If you're if you're a businessman now, are you investing in oil or are you investing in lithium? We all have lithium, we don't all have cars, right, in this, in this room. And the, the, the mistakes that we're making in terms of the ethical violations, in terms of the colonization, in terms of the displacement of people that happened with the, oil, the development of the oil industry is the same thing that's happening now with the development of the lithium industry. And you saw an example with the coup in Latin America, which I'm, I'm or in, in Bolivia, right, which uh, I, I think there's a connection there. So it's, it's really important that if we're talking about a Green New Deal that, that is going to promote justice um, and not lead to the displacement and gentrification of people, that we really have to think, where are these materials coming from, right? Is it necessary? It, just because it's electricity or just because we're electrifying our society, does that mean it's, it's, it's ethical? We can ask for ethical provisions in the Green New Deal, right? Where are the materials coming from? You're talking about electrifying the world. Where are the materials coming from? Uh, and that also um, is something that's in the pamphlet within the, uh, the green, the, an eco-socialist Green New Deal guiding principles, which was produced by the, the DSA. And number four is decommodify survival, right? So when you take that perspective, then you start to ask the questions, is, is someone suffering so I can decarbonize my life, right? Are, are they suffering as a result of my efforts at decarbonization? And those are things that I think it's really important to think about as we set these targets and we agree to, to meet these targets. Where, where is the conversation about ethics and colonialism? Uh, just because it's green doesn't mean it doesn't have those effects. Uh, so I wanted to address a comment that was uh, posed earlier as to how can we all implement uh, climate solutions in our work if, you know, we don't have the time, we have other things to do. And um, you mentioned that you're jealous of the uh, youth climate movement because apparently we do have the time to do that. Um, and we don't, but that's why I'm kind of failing my gym class. It's sacrifices that we have to make, and there is no other way to say it. Um, all these statistics are making us uncomfortable, but we need to be uncomfortable in order to make change. There is no other way of doing that, and a lot of people will get uncomfortable and look away and think, I can just keep living my life because it's not going to affect me. And the point is that we are climate activists, all of you, because we don't want other people to experience the climate crisis, to realize that we are in a crisis. And that is something that is very close to me. I, my town in Mexico was flooded 
when I was 13, and that is when I saw how inequitable the system is. Because my town is a small town that does not have the system to deal with heavy rainfall. It does not have the system to treat sewage, so all the sewage was all over the streets. It doesn't have any of these things that a city does have um, most of the times. So that is when I realized that this is an issue that does affect everybody, but it affects low-income communities, communities of color the most, and that is why it makes a lot of people uncomfortable because we don't necessarily know how to approach that. But through that uncomfortability, we need to implement the action in everything we do. That means I haven't bought any clothes in a year because I researched the clothing industry. That means I buy local things because I researched how much it actually takes for my sh food to be shipped from another country. But those things are also a privilege that we need to recognize. And so if you have the privilege to change your lifestyle, to be more mindful and eco-friendly and conscious, then we have to do it. But it's not only in our personal um, actions that we need to change, but the place in, in which you work at, the place in which you study at, the place that you send your ch children to school, why aren't those places changing as well? There was a policy passed to put uh, solar panels in every New York City public school, and only two schools have solar panels. So even if a policy does get passed, why does it fall through? It's because we become comfortable with what we've achieved. And that is not enough. That is not good enough anymore. Um, and so the first step is you showing up. The second step is taking all of this information and implementing it in your lifestyles. Um. I wanted to uh, speak to the fact of the question, how do we come together with our different fights? And um, I think one thing that we had talked about in our group uh, is defining success in this country. Uh, we define success through economic. However, we need to be defining success through longevity of the actual country um, and of the earth. I think that's one thing. Um, it's also putting forth that effort and that sacrifice. I know uh, in our community, a group of us travel all the way to Wisconsin to get back our ceremonies. And we're putting forth that time that's not easy. You know, We give up a week, four times a year to do it, but you put forth it because it's worth it. And I think that with these different things, we have to decide, is it worth it? And you know, it's not fair that our marginalized communities have to put forth that extra effort but if we're not doing it and we're asking other people to do it, it's just not going to happen. And I think finding those commonalities, uh, when I do work with the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, even though we are indigenous youth from all around the world, our strength comes from finding our commonalities and for advocating in those commonalities because it's very easy to identify what our differences are. But it's very hard to get on that duality that there is not, it's not just white and black. It's right in the middle is where we have to meet. And I think, you know, people look at the, the Green New Deal and they, they think it's so radical. And I understand that there's things that I don't like about it and there's things I do like about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that something has to go forward. And we can't just think that, oh, we're just gonna dismiss it because we don't like one thing. No, we have to figure out what can we come to terms with what can we connect over? And that's how our different uh, fights are going to come together to advocate on what we can connect to and uh, what are the similarities instead of thinking that's a republic thing and a democratic thing or white and a black. No, it's right now, let's figure out what we can connect on and that's how we're gonna implement change. Okay, so uh, I think with that we will uh, keep the conversation going on the other side of the t-shirts. Um, but uh, thank you again to everybody involved, especially we should say, should have said earlier and more loudly to the whole Queens Museum staff. This has been like a really a all hands on deck effort. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, we'll keep, we'll keep it going here, but then in, in the days and weeks and months to come. So uh, we're all gonna stay in touch, but thank you all very much for coming and sticking it out.